Hello, welcome to this presentation and to this class on the structural and tectonic features of the Nigerian basement. So I'm going to, we're going to go over certain things and in looking at the Nigerian basement, the geology of the Nigerian basement, we're going to go, the, the approach we're going to go is to start from the wider regional scale, that is, we look at the the wider regional scale in the sense of putting the basement geology of Nigeria within the context of the African continent. So we look at the wider continental scale. We come down to the regional West African scale before entering into the um, local or the Nigerian scale. And then we look at the structural features of the Nigerian basement so that we, it makes sense as we talk about it, it makes sense. It makes more sense within a regional context. Okay, so this region, the regional context, let's look at the regional context. Now, Africa has the largest area of Precambrian crust of all the continents in the world. Almost all of Africa is underlain by Precambrian rocks, except in the northwestern and southern margins, where you have narrow Phanerozoic mountain belts. This mountain belt, the mountain belt in the, the Phanerozoic mountain belt in the northwestern part of Africa belong to what you know, what is known as the Atlas Mountains of Morocco, extending into Tunisia, and it's part of the whole alpine orogenic system in Europe and all the way into, into the Himalayas in Asia. That system is as a result of Africa colliding into, well, the Atlas Mountains. Part of the Atlas Mountains was formed during the creation of Pangaea, where northern Gondwana collided with um, the North American continent, and that created Pangaea and the Atlas Mountains. And then you also have mountain belts that are as a result of Africa colliding into Europe, which started at the end of the Cretaceous. In the southern part of the continent, you have in the southern part of Africa, you have the Cape fold belt, and these are fold belts that formed in an orogeny that happened in the Carboniferous period that involved Antarctica and South America. This was all before they all separated. But the rest of Africa is basically Precambrian basement. And we use the term basement complex to refer to these Precambrian rocks. But as we shall see, some of these rocks are as young as the early Paleozoic, especially the rocks that have been affected by the Pan-African orogeny. Also, the Precambrian of Africa includes significant unmetamorphosed and undeformed lower Proterozoic to early Paleozoic sequences that form platform deposits. If you read, go to the preamble video that I made, you would see where I defined what platform areas are. Okay, so what are the structural divisions of the Precambrian rocks in Africa? The Precambrian rocks of Africa are divided into two. Cratons and mobile belts. In the preamble, I define what a craton is. And it's a similar definition that we use when we're looking at the Precambrian of Africa. The cratons are stable parts of the Precambrian cross that have not been deformed or metamorphosed since the early to the middle Proterozoic. This is up until about a billion years ago. The mobile belts, on the other hand, are Precambrian rocks that suffered metamorphism and deformation during the late Proterozoic to early Paleozoic Pan-African orogeny. It's good to go again to the geology time scale to know what we mean by the terms Proterozoic, late Proterozoic, early Paleozoic. It's good to go back and look at them. So you have the cratons and the mobile belts. Now, when we say mobile belt in the African context, we are referring to the mobile belts or the orogenic belts that formed during the Pan-African orogeny. There were other orogenies on the African continent which created mobile belts. For example, what we call Limpopo, Bendian, Ebonian. We'll, we'll talk about many of them as we go on. But these mobile belts happen, these orogenic belts are from orogenies that happened in the Archean and early Proterozoic. So we classify those areas as cratons because yes, they've undergone orogenesis or they've undergone some orogenic cycle, 
But these orogenic cycles are so old that those regions have been stable at least for the past billion years. Now, within the cratons also, you have areas where they have not even undergone orogenesis in the past 2.5 billion years from which was during the Archean. And these areas are known as cratonic nuclei. We're not really going to go into all those things because those areas do not really have to do with Nigeria. But in, a, in subsequent courses, in our regional geology course, we'll look at these things in more detail. So this is basically a map that shows the structural elements of Africa. I would say it's not really a very, very beautiful map, as beautiful maps go. But at least it shows the number of things. The cratons are in blue, older than 1.6 billion years. And then you have areas where you have the cratons covered by sediments. Uh, by sediment, platform sediments of that age. And then you have your origins, which are in red, the Pan-African origins, and you have younger, younger origins and younger sedimentary rocks. Now, this is a more detailed map showing the different structural regions of Africa. This is from the Archean crust with this is with supracrustal. Supracrustal is a bit these sedimentary rocks, sedimentary rocks. Um, this is a more detailed diagram that shows different parts. And we'll look at this in more detail when we do our um, regional geology. So, the mobile belts. What are the mobile belts? The mobile belts are late proterozoic to early Paleozoic. The Pan African events, they were, these are areas that were affected by the Pan African event or the Pan African orogeny. The Pan African orogeny was before we now started using plate tectonics to understand a lot of things, the Pan African event was usually described as a thermal event in the sense of you had deformation and you had metamorphosis, which is a result of pressure and heat. So it is this tectonothermal event that led to the structural differentiation of Africa into cratons and movable. That was a previous understanding that there was some tectonothermal event that affected some parts of Africa and didn't affect the other parts. And those parts that weren't affected were cratons, and the parts that were affected were mobile belts. But the current understanding, the plate tectonic understanding, is that the mobile belts are the final stage of a Wilson cycle. Remember what the Wilson cycle is, where you have a previous supercontinent separating from an ocean basins, and those ocean basins close, and you have continental collision. So the mobile belts of Africa are as a result of that final continental collision of different smaller, smaller continents, which are more or less like the cratons. So a good understanding of the Pan-African region is that it is what brought all the different cratons together, which were like separate continents, and they all came together. And then those boundaries are the collision boundaries with all the deformation and everything that is involved with collision belts. So obviously, you're dealing with a cycle of rifting with its sedimentation and magmatism, ocean opening, subduction, and plate collision with its accompanying magmatism. When you look at the rocks of the mobile belt, you would see the imprints of the rocks that came from Even the rocks that came during subduction affected other areas, including South America, Australia, and Antarctica. Why? Because on the global scale, the Pan African orogeny was the orogeny that created the supercontinent called Gondwana. The supercontinent called Gondwana is made up of land masses that are today North America, South America, not North America, South America, Africa. Australia, Antarctica, and India. When we say Africa, we also include Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. So all these places were brought together into one supercontinent at the end of the Proterozoic, in what is known as, in Africa, as the Pan-African Orogeny. But you see the same rocks, and they are called different names, Brasiliano, Adelaidan, Redmore Orogenies in the other continents. 
So this is basically a map showing the configuration at the time of the Pan-African orogeny. And you see the different parts. You see the different parts from the West African Craton, which is which was basically connected to the Amazonian Craton in Brazil. Then you have the Saharan Meta Craton, you have India, you had Australia, and then in between the places where you see the lines are the Pan-African belts, as these regions were. It's so it's more or less like a kind of like islands that were brought together, and then where they crashed into each other, the rocks there are deformed. So this is another map. It is another map showing the configuration at the time of um, the Pan-African. And then you see the different regions. The blue areas are the Pan-African belts. And then you see the Mesoproterozoic, Paleoproterozoic, and Archean Cratons. The Archean parts of the Cratons. Because yes, the Cratons have different ages. So there are some areas that are older and more stable than others. So you have other orogenic events that created those less stable regions in the, in the Mesoproterozoic and the, the Paleoproterozoic and the Mesoproterozoic. Okay. Now, the Nigerian basement belongs to a part of the Pan-African Mobile Belt known as the Trans-Saharan Mobile Belt. This is a 1,000-kilometer one wide and 3,000-kilometer long north-south trending belt on the eastern side of the West African crater. And it has a boundary, a very clear boundary, with the eastern part of the West, West African um, crater. And that boundary is marked geophysically by a, a belt of gravity highs. And there's a reason why you have those gravity highs, because this has to do with the location of what is known as a suture. Now, if you remember when we looked at the Wilson cycle in the preamble video, you notice that once the continents collide, there's still that point where both continents meet. That point is called the suture. And the thing about sutures is that usually beneath the suture, you have dense mafic ultramafic rock, which forms the subducting oceanic plate, which is now underneath. Sometimes that abduct, subducting oceanic plate is the word is used, that is used is abducted in the sense of in subduction, it goes down into the mantle. In abduction, it goes up above the mantle, above the, above the crust. And then it appears on the surface as a rock assemblage that is known as an ophiolite. But because of the presence of that heavy oceanic crust underneath that area, the gravity anomaly is usually high. And that is how you know that the suture is there. It is a narrow region of gravity hides. So the, the, the gravity hide that marks the boundary of the West African craton basically is seen as the Pan-African is, is seen as the suture at the end of the Pan-African continental collision between the passive margin of the West African craton and an active cordillerian. When we say cordillerian, we're basically talking about um, continent ocean subduction. So if you remember the video we did of the Wilson cycle, so what is happening is that the passive margin was, was on, is on the West African craton side. And then, there is an eastern continent, basically the, what is known as the Sahara Metacraton. You see it in the previous images in this, in this presentation, in this video. The Sahara Metacraton. And then that Sahara Metacraton had this subduction zone. And then that collides with the West African Craton during the Pan-African orogeny. And then the remnants of all this, of this eastern craton are the terrains which basically form the Bene Nigerian shield, which is what the Nigerian basement is. Okay, so this is a map. Also, not too clear. It's a bit, it, there's a little bit, a lot of information on this map, but basically, it's a map that shows a map of West Africa, Western Africa. And I don't mean West Africa in the ECOA sense, because this includes North Africa and the, and the Atlas Mountains. So it does, it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not just West Africa in the ECOA sense, but West Africa, the Western parts of the continent of Africa. And then you can see that the Saharan mobile, Trans-Saharan mobile belt is a Pan-African Pan -African belt that is in green, is in green. And it stretches from the Northern Sahara, 
from the what you call the Hoga Mountains all the way down to the Nigerian Shield. Okay, now this is a better better diagram showing different parts. So you have the in the north you have the Tuareg Shield to the West, you have what is known as the Goma Olakogen. The Goma Olakogen is a rift system that did not develop into an ocean basin, what is known as a field rift. And then to the south, you have a wide province that stretches from Ghana all the way to Cameroon across Nigeria, known as the Bene Nigerian province. And it has three parts the Volta Basin, the Bene Full Belt, and the Nigerian province okay so let's look take a closer look because you remember we're zooming in we're going from africa to west africa now down to our near neighbor the bene nigeria province so this forms the southern part of the trans saharan mobile belt into niger burkina faso ghana togo bene nigeria and western cameroon so there are three major tectonic domains in the bene nigerian province Three major tectonic domains. The first one is the Volta Foreland Basin, which has flatline foreland naps. Now, naps are a kind of thrust, thrust tectonics in regions where you have thrust faulting and folds. So it's a it's a it's a combination of thrust faults and folds. Um, it's difficult to explain, but you can check maybe diagrams on YouTube or on, on Google, you see um, it's a thrust fault with faults. It's thrust faults with faults. So you have these four land uh, uh, naps which form the Volta Foreland Basin. Remember what I said? That, that, okay, in, in the preamble video, that's where I talk about foreland basins and how foreland basins are, they could be relatively flat towards the foreland, but as you get towards the mountain belt, they now start being incorporated into the deformation in the mountain belt and these flat line foreland naps are part of that incorporation into the mountain belt then you have the major bene fold and thrust belt what is known as the dahomeyeite and then your hinterland area is what you call the nigerian high-grade nice terrain now these are high-grade nices and migmatites that form the nigerian basin excuse me so this is basically a map showing the Bene Nigerian province, the south, southern part of the trans saharan Mobile Belt, and you can see the Nigerian basement. It doesn't show the Cameroon part. There's really not enough detail in the Cameroon part, but at least this makes a lot of sense. Now, this map basically shows four, the six lithologic zones, the six lithologic zones of the Benue, the Bene Nigeria province, the six lithologic zones, and I will describe them in the next slide. So we can you can always go back to this. You if you since you have the slides and you have the material, you can always go back to this and look at it and make your comparisons. So zone one, zone one borders the West African craton and is basically meta sediments, ultramafic rocks, and gneisses. And these are there are different definitions of them. Zone two is a narrow tract of high positive gravity anomaly. Remember what we said about the positive gravity anomalies. This is because it's underlain by metasediments, gneisses, amphibolites, pyroxenites, ultramafic rocks, eclogites, and basically basic rocks. And basic rocks, for example, like eclogites, are basically related to subducting oceanic crust or remnant of a paleo oceanic crust or ophiolytic complex. This is the suture. So the margin the eastern margin of the west african craton is within zone two zone three is made up of predominantly migmatite gneisses cyanides granites and these are regions that are you have a lot of magmatism magmatism it represents a pan-african molas molas is a kind of deposit where you have a basin very close to a mountain range and then you have a mixture of sediments that that basically fall in, and the whole thing is totally disrupted and scattered. That's what you call molas. Mola. So it's a Pan-African molas deposited in a graben associated with post-tectonic uplift of the high-grade terrains. 
this is something that happens in mountain belts where after the ogenic activity there is um there's post post um post orogenic collapse and then that creates regions where you could have extensional basins it's a very complex thing then the zone four is the western basement of nigeria and then it's characterized by north south re relatively north south trending schist belts surrounded by a nice magmatic complex and then these schist belt and nice magmatic complex are intruded by granite and chanokite plutons zone five is the eastern basement and the eastern basement is characterized by two features first of all pan-african granitic rocks pan-african granitic rocks these are plutons and then the general absence of schist belts even though you find some in some places, for example, in the Oba Massif. Then zone four, zone six is similar to zone four, where you have three assemblages, a lower proterozoic basement of migmatite, amphibolite, and gneisses reactivated in the Pan-African, schist belts made up of predominantly quasites, mica schist, metaconglomerates, calcilicate rocks, ETC, and then a Pan-African granitic suite. So it's similar to the western basement, and this is within Cameroon. So this is a simple geologic map of Nigeria, where you have um, your basement rocks in, in light pink, your Pan-African older, your schist belt in blue, and your Pan-African older granite in dark pink, and then your Cretaceous and Tertiary and Quaternary sediments, um, which form the cover in most parts in your sedimentary basins of Nigeria. So this is a cross-section that goes from the Volta uh, Basin all the way into the western part of the Nigerian basement. And it shows the different structures, especially the deep structures, and you see the amount of deformation that has been, that is taking place and how the rocks are being squeezed and pushed up on top of each other to accommodate the collision of the continental masses at the time. So geology of the Nigerian basement, you have treated this in the lectures that have to do with the igneous and metamorphic rocks of Nigeria. And then you have three major rock units in Nigeria, in the basement rocks of Nigeria. The Migmatite Nice Complex, which is made up of high-grade granulite fasces, Nices, and and these are of Archean to Proterozoic age with their schists and their meta sediments. They are Archean to early Proterozoic age, but they have all been affected by the Pan African origin. Then you have the late Proterozoic, lower grade, supercrustal meta sediments, which occur in what are known as synclinal schist belts. Then you have the syntectonic and late tectonic granitoid bodies, the older granites. Syntectonic has to do with the granites were emplaced during the major tectonic events, while late tectonics has to do with the granites that were emplaced towards the end of the orogenic cycle. Now, the key difference between them, especially in the field, is that the syntectonic granites are more foliated than the late tectonic granites, and they are definitely older, obviously, but they are more foliated because as they have formed they have now been affected by the metamorphism and they have now been the grains have now been squeezed into a weak foliation compared to the late tectonic granitoid bodies now remember that this is different from the younger granites which are a jurassic phenomenon and do not form part of the basement okay so let's look at the general structure of the nigerian basement remember that we have divided it into two western and eastern these are two terrains and this division is not just a division of, in the sense of, okay, we just want to just divide so that we can make our, our job of understanding easier. But there are certain things or certain evidences that point to this division, that supports this division. The first one is that you have a 500 kilometer long lineament, and this lineament is visible in satellite imagery. And it, 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 it clearly distinguishes the western and eastern part into two regions that have distinct tectonic fabric. There's also a contrast in, the, in their metallogenic domains, in their met, in metallogenic mineralization. 
you have gold mineralization, banded iron formation, and green stock deposits in the western part of the basement. While the, the eastern part of the basement is known for its uranium and its pegmatite deposits. And that is why, for example, places like Zamfara and Oshu states where you have gold are on the western side of the basement. And the places where you get tourmaline and some of those minerals are from the pegmatites on the eastern side. Also, the western side has is the basement of the western side is Achaean. Achaean with monocyclic cover. Mm -hmm. That it has a schist belt that has only been affected by the Pan African. While the eastern part has a Bonian protholith with no cover to the east. So it's made up of a protolith that was um, deposited after the Ebonian erogeny and affected by the Pan African erogeny. And then it doesn't have any cover, it doesn't have any schist belts. There's also a difference in the magmatic, magnetic properties of both zones. In general, the characteristic structural trend of the Nigerian basement is north-south, which is basically the, the structural trend of the Trans-Saharan belt. North-south or slightly north-northeast-south-southwest. This foliation is largely mineralogical banding associated with tight isoclinal folds. Now you know what isoclinal folds are. You also have major north-south trending thrust and shear zones that cut across the Nigerian basement and show different deformational regimes. The thrust faults are largely westward dipping. They're largely westward dipping. There are also other characteristics. For example, you have huge thrust naps, especially in the Achaean basement, and this falls the Achaean basement into domes, and the basins between the domes are are occupied by the schist belts. The schist belts are also tightly folded, tightly folded, with also some shearing. The schist belt also has the same structural trend as the basement itself. And then also, there is also later activity of the shear zones. There are also later activities, later activities of the, in the shear zone because there are also made these major north-south shear zones that produce ultra myelinite and then some of them were reactivated in a brittle form in the phanerozoic and these shear zones form the major control or the movement along the shear zones were the major control for the formation of some of the sedimentary basins in nigeria including the benway trough this is a map uh, a geological map of uh, a, a geologic map showing the one of the major shear zones, what is known as the Ifer Ara Fault, towards the east. And you see the relationship between the rocks. This is the Ifer Ara Fault, and then the other one is the Badon shear zone. And you see the relationship between the fault and the, at the amount of folding that has taken place, especially close to the shear zones. The amount of folding that has taken place, the amount of deformation that has taken place. Okay, so um, in the eastern part of the Nigerian basement, there is evidence of four deformational events with their accompanying metamorphism. And these occur during the Pan-African orogeny. So from early tectonics, nap tectonics, and ductile truss faulting to dextral wrench. Wrench has basically is strike slip, and then reactivation of the shear zones with dextral strike strike movement towards the end that is a mistake in these slides it's supposed to be 555 plus or minus 5 million years ago and then these shear zones were activated during the mesozoic and became the major controlling structures of the sedimentary basins for example the benway trough okay we're going to end with a bit of chronology and structural history after giving this general summary because this is actually a summary Chronology and structural history. If we're looking at chronology and structural history, we need to look at them differently because the West and East are two different, have two different histories, two separate histories. The Western part is polycyclic and is known to have been affected by three, at least three orogenic events. So if we're looking at it from in a in a sense of in a chronological way. We start with the presence of magmatite gneisses 
the Migmatite Knights Club complex of the western side. And those Migmatites came from a protolith that is made up of shells, gray wigs, and sandstones with intermediate basalt. Some of the Knights have yielded dates of over 3 billion years, which means that the sediments that, that were deformed into them were much older. In the Archean, there was a fold in the metamorphic phase accompanied by the emplacement of applied schist and banded gneiss. Now, this applied, applied schist is basically metamorphosed intrusive, intrusive rocks. And these are dated at 2.7 billion years ago, which is during the Liberian orogeny. Then there was a second phase of folding that affected the Archean protolith and the early Proterozoic metasediments. This in phase of folding is also related with the emplacement of 2.2 billion year old granite gneisses. And 2.2 billion years ago happens to be the time of the Ebonian orogeny. You now had a period in the near Proterozoic from 1.1 to 700 million years ago, where the younger metasediments or the schist belts were laid down as subduction closed the ocean that led to the Pan African orogeny. And all of this were now affected by the collision and the Pan African orogeny at the end of the Proterozoic. The eastern part of the Nigerian basement doesn't show evidence of being affected by Ebonian and Liberian origins. The magmatic, the migmatic gneisses are monocyclic, with the age of the protodyte believed to be 2.0 to 1.7 billion years old, which is post um, Ebonian. There is no compelling evidence of the presence of the Kibarian orogeny in Nigeria, even though some have pointed to east west foliations as evidence of the Kibarian. Which, which is more prominent in the southern part of what is now the African continent. So in the Pan-African, um, a number of things happened in the Pan-African, intense faulting, folding, thrusting with metamorphism, migmatization, and orogenic mag magmatism, which culminated with the Pan-African orogenic cycle. Now, the tectonics is horizontal, horizontal in the sense that you you, the movement of the plates are in a horizontal direction. And then this created high-grade gneisses and recumbent foliation, and in the basement gneisses and overlying sediments. In some places, you had north-south trending steep sea metamorphic shear zones that form at high temperatures, while in others, the Archean basement was deformed into elongated north-south trending domes, separated by seam forms with protoritory cover schist belt. This is more on the western side of the basement. Now, the Pan-African orogeny was as a result of an oblique collision of the Nigerian province with the West African Kraton. The suture is in Bene Republic. It is also correlated with the Brasiliano belt on the other side of the Atlantic in Brazil. Now, this is basically a schema. You see, it's related to that thing of the Wilson cycle that we talked about. A schema of the <clears throat> a schema of the geodynamical evolution of the Nigeria Bene fold belt, and then you see how you go from um, subduction to collision. Okay, and then this is a map basically showing the relationship between those belts. There's actually lineaments that stretches all the way from Brazil and can be correlated on the African side of the continent. Okay, so we'll end it. We'll end this at this point. Uh, we're going to end this at this point, and then I hope that this slide will be useful. Um, you have the slides. There will be. You can always ask questions if you need to. You can always ask ask questions either you can ask me or you can put it put it in a comment you can put it in a comment you can ask the question in a comment as this video will be made available publicly so thank you